Hello, everyone. My name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Philip uh, Williams. Uh, he's a chairman and CEO of Consolidated Uranium. Mr. Williams, welcome to my show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Look forward to chatting. <laughs> Same here. Uh, I usually ask my guests who are the first time in my show to tell my audience more about themselves. So who is Philip Williams? Uh, how did you get involved in uranium and uh, consolidated uranium? Sure, sure. Well, so I'm based in Toronto um, and I've been working in the finance business in, in Toronto for 25 years now and uh, many different jobs. And, and, I'll, and I'll walk through that uh, in a, as we go here. My first exposure to uranium was back yeah. in 2006. So I was working at an investment bank in Toronto called West Wind Partners, and I was uh, a research analyst, a sell side research analyst. I would write reports on companies, target prices, valuations, et cetera, all in the mining space. And when I started in that job, we were focused on gold and copper and other and other commodities. And uranium wasn't really on the radar screen, but we were. But you know, as you would know, in 2006, as the price started to pick up, 2005, and then 2006, even more so, yeah. uh, quite a lot of interest was was coming in those names. And so they needed somebody to uh, to pick up research coverage. So that was so I got tapped on the shoulder in 2006. I launched coverage of the uranium space in January of 2007. In fact, I have the report sitting right behind me. Um, and it was uh, actually, it was a report that focused on Australian uranium. So I covered Paladin, I covered Laramide and Mega Uranium, all who had projects in Australia at the time. And so I was a research analyst in uranium for a couple of years. And then in 2008, uh, I joined an investment fund in Toronto called Pine Tree Capital. And at Pine Tree, we, ultimately managed about a billion dollars uh, in, in assets, all focused on mining junior equities. It was quite an extraordinary fund and a really good <laughs> opportunity because we invested, we had, we invested across all the different commodities. We had about 400 different positions. So every day you were meeting new companies, getting to know new jurisdictions, projects, commodities. Um, but one of my main jobs there, because of my background in uranium, was to manage the uranium portfolio. And starting in 2008 was really interesting because the prices had come off, but they were about to go higher again to the end of 2010. And names were, were, were quite low in value. So we bought up shares of many companies that still exist today and made tremendous returns over that period of time up until, of course, the end of 2010, and then we all know what happened in 2011, early 2011 yeah. with uh, with Fukushima. In 2012, I left uh, the buy side and went into investment banking as a banker, and uh, I joined a firm in Toronto called Dundee Capital Markets. Doesn't exist today. It was bought out and as a company named Eight Capital. And for four and a half years, I was a banker for mining companies with a with a significant focus on on uranium. Um, we would have raised over that period of time. Close to a billion dollars, been part of part of fundraisings uh, for about a billion dollars for uranium companies, and as an advisor to many different M and A transactions, and so that was uh, was was amazing experience. And over that period of time, those three different roles, what was really exciting and interesting is I got to travel the world and look at uranium projects. I've probably been now to over a hundred different projects all nice. around the world. Of course, many of them that we put into consolidated uranium, and in 2017. Um, things were changing at the bank that I was at, and I really saw an opportunity to become an entrepreneur. And so I partnered up with with some players that are in the space today, Amir Adnani, to, be, to name one, Scott Melby, and Richard Patricio. Yeah. Uh, so here and Scott are at UEC, Richard's at Mega. And we had this okay. idea, we, yeah, so we had this idea to create a pure play uranium royalty company. So we started, so I left investment banking and became the CEO of Uranium Royalty Corporation when it first started. And uh, and I was the CEO there for the for the first two years while it was a private company. Uh, many of your, your watchers might be familiar with the company and know that today it's a public company. It's done extremely well. Scott yeah. Melby's the CEO. And, and I, I passed the torch to him when, uh, when that was happening. And then in 2020, you know, I was sitting in March of 2020, and uh, of course, COVID had just happened. The markets were were down, and and nobody was really caring about uranium. And I got together with Lee Courier, the CEO of NextGen, Richard uh, again, 
who had who had a company that was actually focused in the gold space called Annex Gold, and uh, and we decided to repurpose that vehicle and go after uranium, and that was the birth of consolidated uranium. It was really a, a, the philosophy was let's go and and pick up these projects that are orphaned, forgotten about, nobody was doing anything with that we could pick up for pennies on the dollar and put them into the portfolio. And that's kind of how, uh, that's how CR got started three years ago. Excellent and story. And yeah. Doing that can, yeah. Uh, so you're almost 20 years uh, in uranium. We can call you a uranium veteran. You you have a qualification for, for, for that. For good or for bad. And, yeah. you know, I, I liken it a bit to the mafia. Every time you think you're going to get out and do something else, you get dragged back in. And <laughs> and, and really, it, it really is such an exciting business. And, and mm -hmm. notwithstanding all the ups and downs, um, you really do think that what we're, we're, we're contributing um, to an important part of, of course, the, Definitely. the, Definitely. the yeah. future of power in the, the world. Yeah. I remember the days, uh, it was 2007, I think, when I bought my first mega uranium stock. <laughs> that company really changed from then till now, totally. Uh, before we touch on consolidated uranium the details, I want to hear your thoughts on current status of uranium market. Uh, how do you think uh, both uranium equities and spot price will perform in the remainder of the year? Sure. I mean, look, I'm obviously positively biased towards where things are yeah. going. I can tell you that in my history, I've never been right about timing. Directionally, I think I've been I've been pretty good, but in terms of when these things are going to happen, it's it's hard to know. And and you know, the catalyst that you think might be coming to move things, it may come, and that may not be the catalyst, and some other catalyst might come. But yeah, I agree. It, it increasingly, and and I and I think I'm part of the majority here. I don't think I'm going to add anything particularly new. Although I have a few different, maybe a few different points that we could, we could we could uh, dig into. But uranium prices will and have to go higher. They just fundamentally we we need that to to bring on this this production that's required, the restarts and new builds, of course. Um, I, and I do think that that's that's definitely possible and, and will happen this year. I don't know whether this is going to be the year where we see that big move like we saw in 06, 07. Um, it, it, it doesn't feel like it in this moment, but again, sometimes, sometimes the market moves, when the market moves and we've seen it before, it can move very, very rapidly. Um, you know, the, so I do believe we're going to be end the year higher. It, it, it will not surprise me to have an over $60 price to, at the end of the year. And then I think, you know, that's getting back into that level, I think is the level that will we'll get the investors coming back to the uranium space. It will happen this summer, I'm unsure, but uh, but certainly I think it's a good place to be. Obviously, names are, are other than some of the bigger names like Cameco, there are a lot of names that are trading much closer to their lows than their other highs. And, and we know when, you know, when the price does move and and dollars flow into the space after after they buy the chemicals and the next gens and the and the sprot physicals and and denison etc they yeah, will yeah. That, those funds will come down to these smaller names and the smaller names have a lot more uh upside from here in my opinion yeah definitely and we all know when uranium moves it moves uh big uh okay let's discuss consolidate uh, let's discuss uh, company projects so you have if i count it right 19 projects at the moment uh and that is very impressive for a 136 million dollar market cap company uh can you explain explain to my audience uh which business model is your company taking uh, is it to develop those projects or a prospect generator or combination of both can you expand on that yeah, look, so when we first started the company, it was really about acquiring resources. And quite frankly, the the, the plan was to sit on them. And it was more, it, I'd say it was more of the mineral bank model. Yeah. And we seen it applied in the gold space and, and in some other spaces where there are projects that are fundamentally mispriced that you can that you can buy and put into your portfolio, hold on to for, for a low cost, and ultimately they'll be worth many multiples of what you uh what you paid for them. And that was so that was strategy one. And, and, and again, when we were when we started this in 2020, the price of uranium was in the in the mid to low 20s. 
and uh, and really nobody was getting any any uh, attention in the markets for actually advancing their projects. And our and our model was always: can we lever the portfolio up to more substantial projects, larger size projects, higher grade projects, near term development projects? Because ultimately, the goal is to be a multi asset producer um, a, across a number of different pro different projects and geographies. And so I would say about a year ago, we made the transition from pure acquiring and sitting on assets to actually advancing assets. And that really came about with the acquisition that we did with Energy Fuels, because in that transaction, we picked up past producing mines, fully permitted, much of the CapEx already sunk into them. And so they were very uh, easy targets to easy projects to potentially move ahead back into production. And so I think we're going to continue to move that way. We are going to be very, you know, in this market, you know, a year later with the price down and and uh, the equity markets, you know, not as buoyant, we certainly uh, are are being judicious in the way that we advance the projects. We're, we're really only working the Tony M project right now. And everything else, you know, other than other than, of course, keeping them in good standing and and taking advantage of the, this opportunity to to look at old data and figure out next steps, we're not really actively working those projects, but we're getting them ready so that when things so that when when market conditions improve, and investors will pay for act for project level uh, results, then we'll uh, you know then we can move those ahead. Okay, you touched on uh, your past producing mines in Colorado and Utah. Uh, can you give us more details uh, about these projects, uh, fresh updates on them? Uh, at what current status are they and what's the plan for going forward? Sure, <clears throat> sure. So um, we have Utah projects and Colorado projects. Right now, or just a, a couple of weeks ago, we announced that we're spinning out the Colorado projects into a new company, Premier yeah. American Uranium. And so those those projects will be uh, will be distributed, and the shares that we're getting of Premier will be distributed. Part of them directly to our shareholders in September. So really, the focus is the Utah projects. There's ostensibly four projects there. Three main past producing mines being Tony M, Rim, and Dineros. Last year, we 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 drilled all of those projects. The results are in are are, are out. Uh, we put those press releases out, and they were conf confirmatory but also looking for exploration potential, particularly at RIM and Dineros. The largest project in the portfolio, and we put out a 43101 resource on Tony M late last year at 8.8 .8 million pounds, grading 0 0.27, 0 0.28, which is, which is high grade really. It, and by the way, all of these projects are conventional underground mines. Yeah, yeah. So, so just just to put that out there. So at the Tony M mine, which is the largest and 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 really the the, the biggest value driver for for the company in the near term, we're drilling. Uh, we're we're underway right now on a sixty hole drill program, and that's uh, that's confirmation drilling. Also some extensional drilling. Also we when we did our first drill program last year. The assays showed us that there was vanadium potential to the project. Historically, it hadn't really been investigated. So the uh, the report writer, SLR, said, hey, if you guys go and do this drill program and the results come through the way that we were seeing them in the smaller sample, then uh, you potentially have, uh, we can potentially add a vanadium resource to, to the project. And that's really what we're looking at, uh, at, at bringing in as, as far as this drill program. And that's something that we could potentially have out to the market by the end of the year. Vanadium comes quite often with uranium around the world, but in this part of the world, absolutely, uh, it's very, very common. And, uh, and, and it, the ratios that we were seeing in that preliminary result two, three, four to one. So for every pound of uranium, so 8.8 .8 million pounds, we could have another 16, 24, 32 million pounds of vanadium at seven, eight, nine, maybe $10 a pound uh, where we've seen vanadium trade not, not too long ago. That's a pretty significant value enhancement to the project. Importantly, vanadium can be recovered. So it's one thing just to, oh, we have this this uh, this byproduct in the in the resource, but can you actually recover it and make money from it? And the answer is yes, because the White Mesa mill, which is the energy fuels mill in southeastern Utah there yeah. that we have a toll milling agreement with, has a vanadium circuit. So so there's lots of good reasons to do this work. It's uh, it's underway right now. The other thing that we're working on 
again, this is all part of being ready to, to turn the mine on again when the market conditions are right, is we're opening the underground. So there's what's what's amazing about this project and uh and, and maybe not fully appreciated by the market and something that we need to keep telling people is that again, as a past producing mine, a million pounds has been has been produced, but more importantly, when the original group and it was consumers power back in the 80s developed the mine, they developed 18 miles of underground workings into the project, which is a bit, basically they fully developed the entire mine and only took out a million pounds of that, you know, what would be about 10 million pounds. So there's, so all of that infrastructure is there and that's our, to our benefit. Also surface infrastructure, and there's some pictures on our website, I encourage people to take a look at. Denison put in $15 million of surface infrastructure, shops or bays, gen sets, offices, everything that you need for the mine. So, so yeah. when we look, when we look at turning this back on, all of that CapEx is behind us. And when you sort of compare us and say, okay, what about this project versus a Pierce project? Well, we're so far ahead, both in terms of time, but also, you know, we don't have that CapEx in front of us, which, uh, which is definitely, you know, NPV enhancing if you, if you look at it that way. Yeah, I remember uh, when Denison called that uh, project, and Denison back at, at that day said uh, White Mesa Mill also uh, in, in their ownership. It was 2012, if I remember correctly, when Denison sold oh, US yeah. assets to, to energy fuels, which are the owners today. Uh, can you give me some rough numbers? Uh, what would, what, I mean, in the terms of the cost of mining in, uh, for Tony M and uh, all sustaining costs. Can you expand a little bit on that? Do you have this uh, data? Yeah, look, we don't have that data today. And we need to, as a public company, need to be very careful about put, giving financials around projects before we put out a study into the market. And that's one thing that we're working on. Of course. If you just think about it historically, I mean, these Conventional mines are typically higher cost than, say, an in situ project. Yes. So, you know, when we think about what price we need, we definitely need higher prices than today. You know, and 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 I really, we really take our guide from energy fuels and and some of the things that that, that Mark and Curtis and and the team will say publicly about the prices they need for their projects, and certainly in that sixty five to seventy dollar range. And, uh, and 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 really, what they say is, you know, we want to make twenty dollars a pound um, on on our production. So that so I would say, if you use that as a guide, what 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 we will endeavor to do is give people more concrete numbers. Once we finish the updated resource, including vanadium, then we're going to go and do a PEA. Um, you know, it's really <clears throat> it's mining and it's it's trucking and it's processing. So. Again, there's no capex, but opex is is there, and 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 uh, and I think everybody's everyone's quite aware of what's happening and with the inflationary environment, yeah. price yeah. price of inputs, price of people, price of gas. So it is uh, again, it, you know, I think that we definitely need that sixty five seventy dollar price in order to make uh, make that fifteen twenty dollar per pound uh, profit that we're talking about. Yeah, for conventional U.S. That that's that is the uh, right number. Uh, can you can you expand a little bit on uh, strategic alliance with an energy fuels? Uh, what is what are the benefits from that deal? Yeah, look, there's a couple of benefits, and the first one is the toll milling agreement, which we which we touched on. Yeah. But it, I mean, I should highlight it. We're the only company in in the states that has conventional projects that has guaranteed access to that mill. So that toll under that milling agreement. We we guarantee our our or a space in that mill. Yeah, that that means a lot. Well, well, well we certainly think so. And uh, and listen, if you if you again, if you listen to some of the conversations that Mark has uh, and the energy fuels team has, they're not really looking to do another toll milling agreement with other companies. They might do ore buying, and certainly, uh, I think they're they've they've made public statements to that effect. Yeah. Um, and and you know whether he says it publicly or just kind of behind closed doors, he would say that this is the best toll mailing agreement that they've ever given anyone. And the reason that they've given it to us in this way is because they're a big shareholder of the company. As part of the original transaction, they got nineteen point nine percent equity stake in the company, and uh, that's been a it's been diluted a little bit. They're down to about seventeen percent, 
Um, but they want us to win. They want us to be successful because it will ultimately benefit them through the through share price uh, increases. And 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 so that kind of leads us into the second part of our alliance with them, which is the investor rights agreement, which governs their equity ownership, and it gives them a right to put someone on the board of directors. And I think it's instructive that. You know, they could have put anyone on the board, but but they chose Mark Chalmers, the CEO of the company, to come on the board. And, uh, and you know, I've known Mark for, for years and, and obviously have a huge amount of time and respect for Mark. He's been around the world, mined, you know, uranium in, in yeah. multiple continents, multiple projects. So it brings a tremendous expertise to, to, our, to our team. Um, they get to keep that director while they own over 10%. There's also some restrictions around their reselling of the shares. So ultimately, if they want to exit the position, you know, there's some governors around how they how they can do that, which I think is important uh, for shareholders to understand that, you know, one day you're not going to wake up and all of those shares are, are for sale. Yeah, They also have the right to participate in future equity financing. And so in the last uh, financing that we did, they participated $5 million in, in that financing as part of keeping their their interest in the company. So I think that's a very strong signal. And then the third part of the strategic alliance is this, what we call it an operating agreement. And essentially what it means is that we get to access the energy fuels team as we need them to help us with the projects. So we have our own team and we have geologists and permitting people, et cetera, but, but the team of the, the bench at energy fuels, so to speak, is much deeper and also they have tremendous experience with these projects. So when we need an engineer, when we need a permitting person, when we need another geologist to double check our work or or just to talk through some, some ideas, we get to go to the energy fields team, call them up, come on, work on the project or mining people, electricians, and all of those people we get access to. But importantly, we get to bring them on to, to our team as we need them and pay them for just that period, that, that amount of time. So we didn't have to staff up all of those different disciplines um, and 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 hold those costs on our on our on our balance sheet. We get to access the those those teams as we need them. Okay. Of course, going forward, we're going to build out our own. We're going to continue to build out our own team as, as we move closer towards production. Because equally, the energy fuels team is going to be very busy doing their own projects, and so so we're adding bodies as we go here. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, you have another project in U.S. Uh, in Virginia. It's a coal skill project, one of the most uh, largest projects uh, when you look at the uranium resources. Uh, what's the plan with that project? And uh, do you think that story around moratorium in uh, Virginia will unfold in your favor? I mean, look, eventually, we... Eventually. Uh, yes, we we obviously think that, that, that it will eventually. Um, we're taking a very measured approach there. In fact, I was at the project last week, um, and, and and was happy to go down and and uh, entertain some guests uh, at the at the project itself. I think that I'm sorry. Is it the flat ground or is it on a mountain? How does it look? Oh, it's very lightly, gently rolling hills. It's uh, it's it's actually farmland. So there's some cattle farming there. Historically, it was tobacco farming, and today it's cattle and then some corn. But what's interesting about our the, the project area that we have, so we have 2,000 acres, of which the mine area would be about 150 acres, and the rest of the land is buffer around it. And when you drive down into to that part of the world, it's very sparsely populated. You don't see anybody, and, and nobody will ever see the project from, like, you would have to make a special detour and effort to go and see it once it's up and, up and running. Yeah. Um, so it's very well located in, in that sense. And of course, in Virginia, now much further to the west, there's a, a very rich history of coal mining. Um, so it's not a state that's unfamiliar with mining. What I think is what I think is very encouraging, and, and look, this is part of the, the bigger narrative around what's happening in the uranium world, particularly in the US, where you know you have this massive disconnect between domestic uranium production and domestic demand. And this is not something that's going to be news to 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 you at all. And and also, and, and that applies to the whole fuel cycle conversion and enrichment, of course. But this idea that you can that that you know they the U.S. needs to onshore the fuel cycle is gaining a huge amount of traction in D.C. Virginia is very close to D.C. And so yeah. I think I think I think the the state is starting to open up to hey, 
why would we tie up the largest resource in the country that could provide all the fuel that we need for the reactors in Virginia, because there's four reactors there, and, and they have grand plans to, to, do, to be a leader in small modular reactors and, and, and other parts of the fuel cycle. Why would we tie that project up? So it's, it, and just to take a step back too, that, that moratorium was put in in, in, the, in 1982. It was really a construct of, hey, somebody, uh, uh, the, group, the original group Marlene found this deposit and there were no regulations for mining uranium in in the state, so they said, "Let's put a moratorium in." And we've seen this time and time around the world, time and time around the world. Put a moratorium in, so we can get some regulations in place. The problem was this: you know, fast forward a couple of years while they were working on that, the uranium price went down so far that that the that there was no appetite and no interest in in trying to put these regulations forward, and so that moratorium is really just a historic construct now. In order to move forward, the regulations need to 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 go in place, and we need to get political support for the project. But uh, but we're certainly you know think that there, there's there's a lot of reasons to be to be positive and optimistic about the future for that project. Again, there's just the, with this big disconnect, the idea that the largest undeveloped project will go undeveloped, um, you know, is 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 hard to is hard to believe, and we think that the the risk reward on that transaction for acquiring Virginia is asymmetric to the upside dramatically, um, and so so we're working we're we're not doing any work on the project per se. Uh, we are uh, we are consulting and educating and working with locals on different levels to 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 explore opportunities for moving it forward, and it's um, you know increasingly what we're seeing in in. The, on the federal level and support for for uranium in the country and all the fuel cycle, we think that we think that the timing is really really perfect um, for something to to move on that project. Yeah, it's an enormous project. Um, what about your Canadian projects, uh, Dieter Lake Mountain uh, Lake? Uh, what is the current status of these projects and uh, and the plans for going forward? Yeah, look, these are these are projects uh, again that we put in into the company very early on, and they were building blocks for you know let's let's get some some resources in place and uh, and then look to to get bigger or more advanced projects. Um, Dieter Lake was owned by Fission historically, and then then Denison took took it over as part of that that transaction where they bought J Zone. Yeah. Um, and and then they ultimately dropped it. But conversations with some of the some of the technical team that were around that project suggest there's tremendous potential there. We're not doing anything on that project right now. Um, again, it was a very cheap cheap project to get into. And 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 by the way, there might be a way to monetize it in some other way uh, that you know maybe somebody else takes a look at, uh, at running with that. But that's our resource. We own it. We can we can monetize it. And Mountain Lake is a similar situation again in Nunavut. Um, with a <clears throat> smallish resource, but but good grade, <clears throat> and again, when when we got into it in the first place, we had a we had a uh, technical guy take a deep look at it, and and there could be unconformity style mineralization in that area. <clears throat> we haven't really done any work on it, and again, and it sits in that part of the portfolio, which is let's wait and see, and and maybe it's something that uh, that that uh, we do something on, or or maybe we maybe we find a creative way to uh to bring some another partner into it and you know and you've seen that we're we're open to different types of transactions and and uh and certainly those two projects could could fit that that, that bill okay the same question for your australian uh, projects uh, what is the current status and what are the plans yeah, so so Australia is, is very similar. I mean, Australia is a jurisdiction that we like, and when we think about the map of the world and we think about where we want to be as a company, we want to be in those those jurisdictions that that check. So we have four boxes that we want to check, and it's is it a stable stable geopolitically? Does it have a history of mining? Does it have a history of uranium mining? And does it have nuclear reactors? And when it when a company a country checks three or four of those boxes, that's where we want it to be. And we really wanted to create this diversified portfolio because historically, single asset, single jurisdiction companies have come have, have are risky, and and they, their projects can that pro one project can be derailed overnight for reasons that you can't see. So we wanted to put this diversified portfolio together. I think it's I think it's uh, proven to be the right strategy in Australia. 
we're our our main projects are in Queensland. Queensland is is a is a jurisdiction with a lot of uranium, and you know Laramide and Paladin have very yeah. large projects in in the the state. Um, but historically, well, you know while the state is very heavily into coal mining, historically they've had issues with uranium mining. Um, increasingly, we think there's 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 changes in the political landscape there. We're seeing the head of the op the leader of the opposition party in the country becoming pro nuclear, um, and there are other mines in the country. So I, the project portfolio, we're you know we had a work program that we were thinking about executing this year, just given where the markets are, given that we just don't think the market will reward us for doing that work. We're doing the the you know basically the bare minimum to keep all of those projects in good standing. I believe it's a very nice, attractive portfolio of resources and and strong exploration potential. I think could be I think we could use that anchor potentially on a new company or on a company or as a as a way to get bigger in Australia because we do think that it's going to be a jurisdiction that opens up uh, going forward. So. Um, we're we're you know we're continue to be very excited about it and uh, and but but we'll be opportunistic one way or the other whether it's adding more or potentially um, you know figuring out another another strategy for those assets away from uh, from CUR. Okay, uh, Phil, what about your projects to, from Argentina, like Una Salada project and the other one? Yeah, look, so <clears throat> Argentina, when we talked about earlier, the check boxes, right? And Argentina is not obvious. So it's very obvious for people to say you're in Canada, you're in the U.S., you're in Argentina or in Australia. But why are you in Argentina? Well, Argentina, for people that don't know, has reactor. They have reactors. They're building new reactors. Historically, they've had domestic um, both conversion and enrichment. And importantly, they are very reliant on Russian origin uh, fuel for their for their reactors. They've yeah. also had it. They have a his, history of uranium mining, so there are past producing uranium mines in the country, currently owned by the government agency, and and it's extremely geologically prospective. And in fact, we see we see Argentina as complete white space for us. You know, there's there's really only one or two other companies in the entire country <laughs> looking at uranium. They are you know not nearly as well healed as we are they don't have you know in our view the capabilities to really advance projects in the same way that we do um our projects again laguna salada was one of the first projects we got into fascinating project very low grade but the the mineralization sits on surface it's unconsolidated gravels can be upgraded quite easily contains uranium and vanadium there was a historic economic study which showed very robust economics the project needs to get bigger and so the work that we did last year on the project was to expand the footprint of the mineralization. And it's really just how big do you want to make it? How much work do you want to do? It's very large land areas to, to expand the resource. And we showed that very far to the north, the, 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 the geological formation that holds the uranium continues. And even within that, we found some, some significantly higher grades. Don't think that's representative of the whole area, but certainly it's encouraging. Um, but so for now, We've we've done that work, and we're going to we're going to basically uh, basically just just sit on the project, not do much more work at, in this moment. We just announced the acquisition of a new project again that we're very excited about in a different in a different province, and and uh, Argentina is one of those countries where you have to know what the different pro provinces are. This project was a past producing uranium mine, very high grade, a 0.2 percent uh, uranium, but it also had vanadium and copper. They produce copper at up to two percent copper. We own the historic mine, and and it took us a little while to put this deal together because we basically did a three party deal where we acquired the entire area, consolidated that Quimel district for the first time it's ever been consolidated. We think there's tremendous exploration potential on top of owning a past producing mine, which I think is 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 key. Huge exploration potential for now. We're just doing paperwork. We're taking all the old data. We sent teams to the ground to the project multiple times through the due diligence phase well, before we announced the acquisition. But for now, we're just going to put together all the old information and come up with a work plan. Um, but again, we do think Argentina, we think it's a bit of a, you know, it's 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 going to be a, an area that that people are increasingly going to be interested in. We get inbound calls on it quite a lot from industry players because they understand what's going on. <laughs> doesn't get as much attention from our investor audience, 
that's fine. We're going to continue to do our, our thing and, and, and maybe even uh, do more in the country. Hmm. How much did you, uh, what was the cost of acquiring that project? So Laguna Salada was about a million and a half dollars. The, the majority of that was paid in shares. And those early deals that we did, and, and we've, we've, when you look at all the different kinds of transactions, we basically covered the gamut from staking projects to buying them outright for cash and shares. This was an op, an option deal where we had the where we you know basically put our put our thumb on a project for a small upfront payment, and that was in cash and shares. When we executed the option to acquire the project on a hundred percent basis, there were more cash and shares. And then we owe some we owe payments tied to the price of uranium. And this is how we really structured those early deals. When the price of uranium hit certain milestones, we had to make additional payments. Importantly, those payments we could make in shares, which uh, you know, so, so we were reducing the amount of dilution that we'd have to take. Um, one of the first payment on that project was made, it was fifty dollars a pound, and then payments at seventy five and a hundred dollars were also in the original deal. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, come back to Coles Hill. Uh, you paid that project forty million, if I remember correctly. So that was the price of the. So it was an all share public markets acquisition. Virginia was a public company. It was an all share deal. The price of our stock was about a dollar eighty, dollar ninety when we completed the transaction. So in today's at today's dollar thirty five, dollar forty share price. It's probably closer to thirty million dollars in our market cap today that we paid, but at the have time, you, yeah. at the time, forty million. Yeah. Have you ever did a math on all your projects? What were what were the acquisition costs for all your projects? Have you done that math? Well, I mean, look, and while I think that that metric is important, you know, it it wouldn't be as germane, for example, in the energy fuels transaction, because First of all, the 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 resources are are smaller. So you've got you know where you're buying 160 million pounds for 40 million at Virginia. The Tony M project is 8.8 million pounds. Rim and Daenerys ostensibly yeah. have you know they have small resources, but we know that those resources continue. Once we get underground on them, we're going to be successful exploring and finding more more material. So that one would look like it'd be. It, Doing a doing an entire portfolio calculation, first of all, it'd be skewed by by uh, Virginia because it's so much bigger, and second of all, I think it would you know it wouldn't show the val and and the toll milling agreement and the partnership, okay. and the fact, the fact that all the capex you could buy if you buy a project you buy a ten million pound project and you spend twenty million dollars on it and it, and you have all the capex in front of you, well, the per pound price you it might look great on a per pound basis. But you would have to add in, in my opinion, you add in the capex that you're paying. Where in these projects there is no capex, so I well, see what I, you mean. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah the, I, the I metrics, agree. Yeah, the metric's important, but it's but I think on a portfolio basis, it's a, it would be a little misleading to give you just one number. Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about share structure and skin in the game. Can you expand a little bit on share structure? What are, what is the current uh, number of shares outstanding? How many options? How many warrants? And after that, please uh, tell us about the skin in the game. How many sure. shares do you personally own and the management? Sure. So we have about 99 million shares out, just slightly over that. There are 6.7 million options. 15 million warrants. One thing that's important about the warrants, and I don't have the schedule in front of me, but a lot of our warrants uh, will come due by the end of this by the end of this year. So, so we did in the very early days, we did you know fairly consistent financings. Yeah. Uh, we did five financings in a row when uh, from when we started the company at progressively higher prices um, and progressively larger sizes. The last financing we did was twenty five million dollars in uh, t at the end of 2021 uh, but a whole host of those warrants are going to roll over or are going to either be exercised a bunch of them are in the money some of them are not in the money today and we'll see where their price is at the time but so that part of the capital table is going to clean up by the end of this year dramatically or and or we're going to either they expire or we get the capital in um which i think is it is important as well um as a management team and board we own about five to 6% of the stock. 
I've got personally exposure through the shares that I've purchased and I participated in virtually all of those financing, financing. road yeah. checks myself. Um, I own approximately 4 million shares or shares and options and, and warrants. Cause again, I participated in those financings. Um, and, and then the rest of the board would own the balance of that, say, call it 2%. Um, energy fuels own 17%. And then, and then we have a whole raft of institutional investors from all over the world who have participated in those financings. We've raised just north of $50 million between all of those financings and uh, heavily subscribed by institutional investors in Canada, in the US, Australia, Europe. Um, and so, many so of the re retail is uh, below 50%. I would say for sure, for sure. One interesting thing is that, um, and and it's it could be germane for for your audience in the next in the coming weeks. We're owned by a couple of ETFs. Yeah, uh, we're owned by URNJ. We're owned by URNM. We're not owned by URA. And so every six months the URA rebalances. Rebalance. Yeah. Every six months we get put on the short list, and then up until now. Uh, we haven't been picked to to join. There are smaller companies, less liquid companies, less uranium focused companies on the URA than than we are. I mean, the last rebalance they they put a couple of lithium companies on. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. And and you know, with our exposure to uranium, our near term producing assets, and and the you know everything that we have going on in the company, it seems like they're they're making a mistake. Um, we can't, uh, we, you know, we don't have any control over whether they add us or not, but that could be a very uh, good catalyst for the stock, you know, and that's July 31st uh, is when the rebalancing happens there. I just noticed today, Selective issued the press release that said, or they, I think they issued it a little while ago anyway, but we're on the short list. So, you know, if you were, if you're a betting, betting person, um, I think at some point we will get on that. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense rationally that we're on these other indexes and smaller companies and less liquid companies and less uranium focused yeah, companies yeah. Are, are included and we aren't. Uh, can you tell me more about your team? Who are the people behind consolidated uranium? Sure. So again, and as I pointed out, the company was originally founded by Lee Courier, Richard Patricio, mm -hmm. Next Gen, uh, and, and two other gentlemen that are still on the Next Gen board. They founded the company originally. They've subsequently left the board, but Lee particularly and Richard remain very close advisors to the company. On the board of directors, we have a very uh, strong mining and finance and M&A experience base. So it's gentlemen that have been um, around the mining business, the finance business, and with experience in m and including Mark Chalmers that we talked about. And then on the team, on our management team, we've uh, about a year and a half ago, when we made that transition, we were talking about from pure hold projects and sit on them to, okay, now we're going to work on these projects and advance them. We brought yeah. in Marty Tunney. He's, he came on as the president and COO. He's a mining engineer, experienced permitting and building mines in the Americas. He's come on to lead to lead that charge, and really, that's that's what their focus in uh, in the U.S. And then beneath him in the U.S., we have very senior geologists, very senior permitting guys, and then a, and then a team of people uh, below them. I think the one person, the latest addition to the team of note that we put a press release out on earlier this year is a lady by the name of Tracy Primo. She came on to the advisory board. Tracy is a lifelong nuclear power worker. She worked at the Bruce Power Plant in Ontario for her entire career, 31 years. She's a nuclear power expert. Um, she She's now on the board of OPG, Ontario Power Generation, the biggest uh, nuclear utility in the country, and uh, and is a passionate supporter of, of uh, nuclear power. She's also uh, f a First Nations which uh, which is very important, of course, yes. and her expertise. She So she's on the advisory board, but really helping us navigate uh, and listen and engage with the, the First Nations communities and the projects that we have. Tremendous resource, um, an absolutely amazing person. And, and just, uh, I got to spend, she came down to Virginia with us last week. She got to spend a lot of time with her and, uh, 
and, and she's brought already brought a huge amount to the to the to the company after you know only a, a few months being involved. Yeah, you touched on First Nations. Uh, what kind of connections do you have with them? What kind of relationships? So look, every project is different in terms of who who is involved and who you have to consult. And one of the projects that you that we didn't talk about when we talked about our Canadian portfolio is the Matouche project in Quebec. And the Matouche project is undoubtedly a world-class potential project on a grade basis. It's one of the highest undeveloped project grade undeveloped projects in the world. At the in the in the indicated category, it's one percent. You don't get grades like that outside of the Athabasca Basin. Yes. Um, that project historically had a had a had a issue with social license. So it's the 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 Cree First Nations. Uh, that that's the it's their lands that the project's on, and so really again Tracy is Tracy is taking the lead there with Marty to build those relations within those communities to see if we can we can bring them in as partners on the project potentially and 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 talk about ways to to potentially advance the project um but so again in you know in 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 Utah we're we're not in engagement with the uh, First Nations because they're not they're not uh, uh they're not landholders and, and they don't have uh they don't have exposure in that same yes. way um but uh but you know where we do have those uh those concerns and 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 issues we want to deal with them head on and and in a in a respectful engaging way and and really that's where Tracy and and Tracy will lead us to the to the right groups and consultants and people that we need to bring on to the team as we need them yeah. uh one final question Philip uh, on what other commodities are you bullish name five five yeah. uh, okay um look i'm extremely bullish on copper i think that uh you know and it's let's i think the long term the long term potential there is huge we there's there's going to be a tremendous need for for large copper projects so uh yeah certainly you know and that again that Fumel project had a, a, a very interesting kind of uh potential for me on that basis i think vanadium is also going to be uh going to be very interesting um and so very happy to have that as a byproduct nickel Definitely. nickel maybe shorter term i think there's probably some some issues with nickel but longer term i think nickel's got got tremendous upsides gold i, I personally have quite a lot of exposure to gold and i'm and i feel you know very comfortable with that and but gold you know if i don't know which way when uranium is going to move i clearly don't know how gold is going to react to 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 whatever is going on but i do but again i i, I like hard assets um how many is that is that four yeah four but you can uh, say precious metal in total so that would be six altogether <laughs> if you're okay. if you are bullish on gold you are probably bullish on silver and platinum yeah, exactly. uh that's about it uh philip thank you very much for being my guest and i wish you luck with all your all 19 of your projects uh, and hope to speak with you sometime soon. Yeah, no, I'd really like that. And thank you. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much, Phil.